welcome along everyone to this evening's presentation, which is equine welfare cases, the ins and outs from reporting to rehoming. My name is Hannah Marsh. I'm the British Horse Society Regional Manager for our South region, and I'm delighted to be joined by four experts in the field of equine welfare. From the BHS, we have Dawn Avery, one of our welfare field officers. Penny Baker is a welfare field officer with World Horse Welfare. And finally, we'll hear from Lauren Bush and Abby Leach, Horse Rehoming Coordinators at the Blue Crosses Rehoming Centre in Burford, Oxfordshire. Good evening. Um, yes, I'm Dawn Avery. I'm a Welfare Field Officer for the British Horse Society. Um, I cover the South East London and Essex. Um, I thought I'd just touch briefly on my background. Um, I'm a little bit uh, long in the teeth, so I try to make it brief. Um, but it's strange because I did start out um, in my early days in the 80s actually aiming for the BHS exams and uh, I started off as a working pupil in Leicestershire working towards my AI and then I went on to another yard in Surrey and achieved my BHS Intermediate Instructor's Certificate. And then I went on to groom show jumpers then had a spell of doing what I call normal jobs away from the horses. Uh, I spent 10 years working for Richard and Marjorie Ramsey, grooming and riding show horses, where I was fortunate enough to be given a ride on a small hack, and we qualified for the Royal International and Horse Year Show five years running. I then went and worked for the RSPCA as a London inspector in 2001. Um, I was an inspector for 10 years before then becoming chief inspector from 2006, uh, sorry, 2010 for a further six years. Uh, I joined the BHS um, as their first paid field officer in 2016. And we now have um, two other field officers, um, Cathy Hyde, who covers the Northwest and Vicky John, who covers Wales. Uh, could we go on to the next slide, please, Hannah? Thank you. I'll carry on. Next slide hopefully will be about joint working. Um, joint working is absolutely essential. I think I can speak for all of the charities on this. Um, all the, the big recognised charities I work closely with. And also, um, there are also some very good small charities as well. Um, all the charities rely solely on donations from the public and none are government funded. So I think many believe that the RSBCA are government funded, but they're not. Um, so we, we're all very dependent on donations. And I know this year due to COVID-19, uh, most charities have been hit very hard on this. So, so just moving on, um, regarding welfare concerns and how the BHS respond to them. Um, Hannah, next slide, please, when you're free. Um, the, B, the BHS respond um, to, yeah, roughly about 1,300 welfare concerns, certainly have done this year. Um, these are either phoned into our welfare department in Warwickshire um, or emailed and there are the odd occasion when they come directly to the field officers or volunteers, but then they would still then be added to our database, especially because of the health and safety aspect in case an owner has been volatile in the past. Um, we monitor hundreds of welfare concerns and provide ongoing support and advice to horse owners. Uh, so the welfare team would contact me if a welfare concern was within the area that I cover. And if a volunteer cannot attend due to the nature of the concern or the distance or perhaps even their unavailability, then that's where I come in. Um, so I would first of all, have a look and see what the allegation is, um, decide how I was going to approach it. But more often than not, I would just think, keep an open mind, think outside of the box a little bit and I would attend the field or yard wherever the concern would be. Um, if there was an owner or person responsible for the horse or horses available, obviously I would liaise with them and just try and decide whether there was a need for further advice because sometimes we'll 
be given a welfare concern and there's no cause for concern. Um, if the owner cannot be traced straight away, which is actually more often than not, um, I would leave a card on the gate or fence or wherever it might be, hoping that there will be a response from that owner. Um, and then ideally, it would literally be, um, you know, just educating that person of whatever may, may, they may need advice on. If I was to attend um, a welfare concern where it was really apparent that a vet was needed straight away, it's very, very rare for me to go to a welfare concern like that. But if an animal was clearly suffering a great deal, then obviously a vet would need to be called straight away. Um, the BHS do not take in horses, uh, so if an owner was unable to cope any longer um, and they were looking to sign over their horses, then I would work hard liaising with the other organisations. Um, most likely would be the ones mentioned in the joint working slide earlier and um, hoping that they may be able to help me and take in that horse or horses. Um, I suspect everybody knows that the, the, um, all the charities are bursting at the seams, so it's not always that easy. So the idea would be to work with the owner over a period of time until that horse or horses could be moved on. Um, if one of the other charities did take in um, a horse from a BHS job, then we would try to assist financially by paying for castration of that animal if necessary um, and paying for passport and chip all depending on what the the circumstances are i am currently working with an rspca inspector on an ongoing job obviously i can't say where it is or names or anything um, but it is involving a vulnerable person and we have re removed some ponies uh, that are signed over and the rspca are boarding them and we're paying for the castrations and other extra costs to help because uh, it's unfair to expect them to foot the bill on everything, especially when it was my welfare concern to start with. Um, could we move on to the next slide, please, Anna? Um, so reasons for poor welfare. Um, these are just some examples. It's fairly endless. Um, ignorance is a key one. Um, first time horse owners, I think uh, there's a lot of that, especially um, when you look on social media. Um, there's a lot of it on sort of the local sites where people want to take on horses and ponies. And one of the most common ones I see, and I, I'm sure my colleagues do as well, is somebody will post that there's um, abandoned horses or ponies without that being proven. And um, you know, the general public mean well, but they want to rush out and one, they want to take that horse or pony when if they did that, that would actually be classed as theft. But also um, they want to provide a home for it without any real knowledge of how expensive that will be and the care that that horse or pony would need. Um, it is quite rare to go to over cruelty and neglect cases. Um, certainly for me now in my BHS role, but even as an RSPCA inspector, um, because these sort of jobs do get onto social media and the press, it looks like they're an everyday occurrence. I'm pleased to say they're not, um, but sadly it does go on and um, I'm pleased to say that I don't see this very often these days. Um, overproduction, indiscriminate breeding is a big one. Um, we'll all see fields full of um, horses that are constantly breeding, still with stallions running with them, foals every year. And uh, I'll come on to that of how we're trying to tackle that issue. But it, it is a, bit, a very big problem. And something else that actually isn't mentioned on this slide is hoarding as well. Hoarding is very common. Um, and that's quite linked with the current job I'm dealing with with the RSPCA. A lack of money again um, this year, particularly with COVID-19. So far, I'm going to touch wood, so far um, I personally haven't dealt with any welfare concerns that directly linked with COVID being a factor, but I fear that going 
further into the winter, um, I may see an increase in this. And, uh, and I think where people are facing redundancy and uh, also taking on too many animals that they can't cope with, that does come into it. We all know that vets and farriers um, and just general care is very expensive. It's certainly not cheap to keep a horse. Um, family problems, um, I think that speaks for itself. And illness. This, so this is just a few ex reasons why, you know, an animal could possibly end up suffering. Think, next slide, please, Hannah. Um, yeah, the law, I'll, I'll only touch on this very briefly because otherwise that could be a whole nother evening um, it went into the law and doing the job that I do now, um, we don't enforce the law. Uh, what is very important for me to touch on is that none of the charities have any powers. I think there's a great belief that um, some charities have the power to go in and remove animals. Um, they don't. The police are the ones that enforce the law. Um, so often, again, you'll see um, other charities being mentioned. Why don't they do this? Why don't they do that? It, it's it's just not that easy. Um, it mentions about the, the basic needs that an animal um, should have. So basically, the Animal Welfare Act places a duty of care on anyone responsible for an animal. Um, that person needs to take positive steps to ensure that they care for their animals properly and they must provide for the five welfare needs which are listed in this slide. Um, I don't think I need to go in any detail of what each, what each need um, means, uh, environment, diet, normal behaviour, um, etc. I think speaks for itself. And again, if I was going to the law, it, it would take up the whole evening, I think. Um, so an animal cannot be removed from a location without the owner's permission. And the only way it can come away um, if it was suffering or likely to suffer is by the charity that was present at the time, calling a police officer um, and or a local authority inspector, but it's rare to find one of those. Um, and a vet would also need to certify that that animal is suffering or likely to suffer. And it's only then that um, any of us basically uh, could remove an animal. The police officer would then hand the care of that animal or animals over to what normally it would be the RSPCA. Um, I'll let Penny uh, say about the World Horse Welfare angle from it, but because the BHS don't take in horses, uh, we would never have that animal handed over the care of us because we, we can't board it. So again, that's where the joint working comes in. Um, we do occasionally assist with uh, welfare cases. So again, um, in extreme situations, you know, again, if we if we had to go down that route, we would assist the RSPCA um, or World Horse Welfare or Red Wings or sometimes Blue Cross. Um, the RSPCA, the only charity who will take on a private prosecution. However, just on that, um, HAPA, who are in Lancashire, um, on occasions have been known to take on private prosecutions as well but when they're dealing with big multi-animal cases they will also work alongside the RSPCA. Um, private prosecutions can run into thousands and thousands of pounds so again that's where the donations are so important. Um, when any of us I think go out to look at welfare concern we always in the back of our mind have those five basic needs in the back of our minds, because that's very much what we work on and the DEFRA codes of practice. Um, next slide, please, Hannah. Um, what are, is the BHS doing to tackle these issues? Um, I've already mentioned about our amazing welfare advisors who are all volunteers. Um, we also work um, alongside NUKE and the other big charities 
to run equine link days. And these are passport and chip days. Um, in the picture, you'll see our Waybridge. We also take the Waybridge along to a lot of these now. Um, so we can give advice and try and educate horse owners. Um, and these are gradually growing and evolving each year. So all of the big recognized charities uh, come on board with that. And uh, we encourage as many people as we can to come along. And um, it's always used to start just with the uh, passport microchips, but we're doing so much more with those now. And uh, we try and run them throughout the year. And again, sadly, this year, uh, everything stopped because of COVID. Um, we attend liaison meetings. Um, I chair a new meeting alongside Joe Franklin, who is the centre manager of Red Wings in Nazing. Um, the BHS headquarters uh, do a lot of lobbying with the government. I know the other big charities do as well. And uh, we offer advice and work on education and community projects and uh, provide educational material. Um, next slide, please, Anna. Thank you. And going on from, you know, talking about that and the clinics that we run, the healthcare and education clinics, uh, we've completed 28 clinics so far since the first one in 2015. Uh, these clinics are designed to try and tackle the overbreeding. Um, vets from Beaver come down and volunteer for this, uh, which we're very grateful for. And uh, we've completed 28 clinics, yes, since the, the first one, 2015. I think I just repeated that. Um, and we now often have a farrier on site. Um, we offer wormers, education and advice in general, dentistry, um, and again, the passports and chips. And we also have the way bridge at these as well. And it's fantastic because again, we have all the big charities um, come along and offer help on the day. And, uh, you know, and we all work together to try and achieve the same outcome. Uh, so far, we've castrated 600 horses and ponies, and in total, 1,300 horses have attended these clinics. Uh, next slide, please, Hannah. Um, moving on um, to, we actually call it fate with friends at the end. Um, we also help horse owners at that time um, when sadly you might have to make or we, anybody might have to make that awful decision of having their horse put to sleep now that could be for a number of different reasons and we will never judge that person why that decision is made it might not necessarily be for veterinary reasons but we will never judge that person we were there just to support them offer guidance and some people have never been through having to have an animal put to sleep and they will have no idea um, what to expect, what the process is and the different options available. Um, sometimes it just literally is a phone call. Sometimes um, before the COVID thing, we might just sit down and have a, a cup of coffee with them. And sometimes it, it is literally to be there in person. Sometimes owners like somebody from the BHS to actually be present on the day and it has been known where the owner doesn't want to be there at all and we will stand in for them so that is available um and uh yes i haven't mentioned actually that we actually have 72 trained uh bhs friends and they are all volunteers as well so um we are very grateful to our volunteers for that and uh so next slide please hannah um, yeah, BHS is all about prevention through education. Um, we, we have many, many leaflets. Um, if ever any of you needed leaflets, just contact us and we can post those out. And they can also be found on the BHS website as well. Um, there are campaigns of, such as Think Before You Breed, um, the React How to Be Colic, um, and various other things, Strangles Awareness. Um, an excellent thing to look at regarding Ragwort is the Ragwort Toolkit on the BHS website. And, uh, and again, we give talks and presentations such as this one. Uh, the Horse Health Days are very similar 
to the clinics link days with the exception of we do go out to yards um, when we're invited to do so and we use the little horse box that's in the picture there and we go along and that has the Weybridge on board and various literature so again the aim is to go along and weigh the horses and give advice uh, where needed and hopefully again um, just help to educate the, the general horse owner. Um, next slide please Hannah. Um, I've said everything very very briefly um, but uh, if anybody wanted to contact us regarding welfare um, the welfare email address is there along with the phone number and it's always worth checking Facebook out for our welfare Wednesday posts as well and also if anybody did have any questions about the way um, the BHS works or any more about the way I work then please feel free to, to pop an email to Hannah and I'll do my best to answer the questions. Super. Yeah. Uh, good evening everybody and I just wanted to say a thank you to the BHS for inviting me to speak this evening and thank you all for joining us. Welfare is something that I'm is not just a career for me I'm incredibly passionate about it and I strongly believe that the more that we can spread the word that horse welfare affects every single one of us then the more chance we have of improving the welfare in this country and indeed further afield as well. The UK has some of the world's best animal welfare legislation and yet we are still in the midst of an ongoing equine crisis. Um, tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about the details of my role in welfare, being a frontline officer for World Horse Welfare and in particular what's involved in a standard welfare visit right through to equine removals and seizures on investigation cases. Next slide please Hannah. I think it's probably appropriate just to show you what my career path looks like um, and how I ended up where I am today. And the area to highlight about my background is that in 2005, I joined the RSPCA as uh, an inspector. And I served for 12 years in that role. And for a good portion of that time, I also held a specialism role of equine officer. And this role was really created to respond to the needs of equines in the UK, but also to respond to the demands from the public for having equine knowledgeable officers. And the national team of equine officers, in addition to their normal role of inspector, would, for example, attend horse fairs such as Appleby, um, Stowe, Wickham. And they'd also promote rehoming events such as Your Horse Live and um, Equifest uh, in Peterborough as well as being part of, of teams that they specialise in rounding up large groups of feral horses or unhandled horses. In 2017, I joined World Horse Welfare to branch into that specialism role on a full-time basis. Uh, next slide, please, Hannah. I can't actually see the slide, Hannah, has it changed? Yeah, okay. Um, the skills that are required for both the roles that I did are, are really quite similar. But as the equine crisis deepens at World Horse Welfare, we have developed new skills to help us achieve the improvements for equine welfare. And so my main task as a, a field officer is to respond to the calls of concern from, from members of the public. And during these visits, we aim to listen to our horse owners and, you know, echoing what Dawn said, we, we aim to educate, but also influence, uh, challenge and assist to improve the welfare of the animals that we visit. And with the help of the owners, achieve higher welfare results, crucially on a, a, what is hopefully a long term basis. I think it's important to recognise that um, our ethos is to work with horse owners to identify um, and correct welfare issues. However, we also know that science-based evidence tells us that, for example, for people who smoke, um, wagging a finger at that person and telling that person to quit smoking simply doesn't work. 
Um, it's what they've always done and it's a habit and it's become a way of life for them. So helping an owner identify something that needs changing in their horse's welfare is similar in its makeup. Um, and this human behaviour tool that we started using is, is called motivational interviewing. And there's plenty online on the internet available if if those if people are interested in knowing more about it. But um, this method of change has been around for quite a long time, and it's really initially been used in the therapy and health industries. Um, but its use was identified as being so potentially successful that it's a transferable skill in so many other situations. And it's really a listening and engagement tool that has provided some really astonishing results for us at World Horse Welfare. And we really anticipate that human behaviour change is key to seeing more improved long term results in our current equine welfare crisis that we find ourselves in. However, there are, you know, we also recognise that motivational interviewing is not a miracle cure and there are inevitably some people in life that be open to this method of communication or indeed there are situations that we visit which on that first occasion are so dire that immediate action is needed. At this point I'll just touch upon again like similar to how Dawn did um, in relation to the Welfare Act because it is a key part of, of the work that we do um, and it's really important that we recognise the two main parts of the Animal Welfare Act that we work with. So. Section nine is what the Animal Welfare Act says an animal is likely to suffer if the circumstances do not change. It also encompasses the five freedoms that Dawn uh, talked about. And so when we make our visit, we will dynamically measure issues that we see um, against those five freedoms and against the codes of practice that are issued by the government. And every horse owner is actually duty bound to be aware of what the codes say. I think in reality, many horse owners, good horse owners alike, you know, even are not aware of their existence. But the codes are there and they set out what are recognised as good standards of practice um, that we should all be working at in the UK. As a field officer, I spend time with an owner putting into place an improvement plan which naturally this will be over a period of time and that amount of time can vary considerably depending on what the issue is. But if, if an owner cannot show or prove that steps have been taken um, and that you know, the time has passed, then it's likely um, I, I would escalate the matter again, depending on the severity of the issue, that time frame you know, can be varied. And I'd stress at this point that generally our team are really successful in achieving the improvements that they seek. And it is ultimately far more preferable to achieve these goals with an owner rather than taking matters into uh, out of an owner's hands. So the next step then is to cover the other part of the Animal Welfare Act, which is known as Section 4. And this is when an animal is actually being caused to suffer. So... Um, Whereas in section nine, we talked about an animal which is likely to suffer. Section four is actual suffering that's been caused to the animal. So this suffering, as Dawn mentioned, um, can only be certified by a veterinary surgeon. Once the certification is established, either um, an equine is willingly signed over. So that would be an, uh, an owner relinquishing their ownership or the equine must then be police officer and only then can the equine be removed and there's really no exception to that rule. I think with, you know, Dawn will I'm sure agree with me that with years of experience you gain a good insight into what a vet is like to class as suffering and so if I make a visit where those initial suspicions that the equine is already actually suffering then the escalation is straight to the RSPCA. There may be some slight exceptions to that rule however um, and this is really where public understanding is perhaps sometimes lacking. This is not a vet saying that an animal is suffering because it's got slightly long or cracked feet or, or that it's a little bit underweight or it should have really been seen by a vet. This is a vet actually putting their professional opinion on the line, willing to stand up in a court of law at a trial and say that the equine has suffered because, for example, if it had a body score of 0.5 out of 5 or its feet had curled up and were off the floor and curled right back over again or if the horse had collapsed and it'd been down for days. From experience I can tell you that 
what a normal member of public will feel is suffering is not is not what a vet will deem is suffering. Um, it's true also that vets' opinions on suffering can vary greatly because, after all, it, it is an opinion. The supporting vet will be required to explain and effectively prove or convince a court of the details of that suffering, and they must be confident in their own opinion that they are right. And also remember, once you're in court, there are two sides. There is a prosecution side and there is a defence. If the prosecution side have a vet or an expert witness or sometimes both, so too will the defence. So the prosecution vet will be responsible for explaining why the equine has suffered and also importantly, the mechanics of the suffering. But the defence vet will be responsible for explaining why it didn't suffer and why they disagree. Police and trading standards or the animal health sector are actually the prosecuting agencies in England and Wales. However, largely over a lack of resources and because of a, a lack of expertise in animal welfare, prosecutions are routinely undertaken on a private basis, as Dawn said, by the RSPCA. There are some circumstances where the police and trading standards uh, will take on welfare court cases but it's, it's normally for very, very specific reasons. And therefore, our working relationship with the RSPCA and their offices is absolutely key, as it is with all the other organisations too. Um, we both have mutually beneficial tools that we can utilise for assistance on both sides. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more of those shortly. I thought we'd take a look at a case study now to explain to you um, everything that we've basically just covered. So I'm going to introduce you to a horse called Monty. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please, Hannah. Very overgrown feet. Um, in this scenario, I tried very hard to work with the owner and was given a reasonable amount of time to instruct a farrier and to actually have them attend. Um, sadly, he failed to take that action over the two week period. Um, during that period, I was returning regularly to make, you know, make checks on the horse. Um, but it reached a point where I could now escalate the matter when no action had been taken. So after requesting the attendance from the RSPCA um, and with the attending vet and inspector present, I was able to show what efforts had been made to engage with the owner. Um, the vet agreed that the horse had, was now suffering and hence the removal of him was possible. Monty was successfully removed and treated and his owner was prosecuted. Um, for this offence, he was found guilty of a section four suffering in relation to the horse's feet, as well as guilty of a section nine failing to meet the needs in relation to tethering. The court found that the DEFRA codes of practice had been breached and they, as they stated that the tethering should only be used as a short term measure and while this was used as a long term practice for this stallion and hence the breach. If we go to the next slide, please, Hannah. And this is our friend Monty now. Um, you can see the picture on the left of the feet is a um, huge amount of heel in the before picture. And then the picture on the left is after he's had his trim. Um, actually, we took an awful lot of x-rays for this horse to make sure um, that the internal damage was rectifiable. And that is Monty on the right um, and now available for rehoming. So happy ending for him. So what is my role when we work with the RSPCA and we find ourselves in a situation where the equines will need to be seized and removed? And so for the most part, again, with some exceptions, the process of equine removal is not something which is pre-planned um, and hence it can happen at any time, although it does seem to have a habit, habit of happening on a, a, a Friday. But it can be any time of the day or night and with little or no notice. And this means that we need to have facilities and resources at our availability. Often our field officer's experience is vital to assisting the RSPCA. So I might be involved with catching or handling, maybe with the vet work or loading or rounding the horses up. Um, I'll often work with the vet while he or she is doing the examination. Um, 
And it's always the case, there's always a, a fair amount of paperwork that needs to be filled out too. I think the fact that we're able to concentrate on the equines is so helpful to the RSPCA because it means that the inspector is freed up to deal with an owner or maybe to gather other evidence, um, photographic or video, for example. And having been in that role myself, there is nothing harder than being stuck on that job by yourself, trying to handle a horse, deal with the vet, keep an owner calm, maybe log all the evidence, as well as arranging the transport. And so if we're not already involved with the job, it's quite common practice that the inspector will ring us direct and then we'll we'll drop everything and we'll get there as quickly as we possibly can. can. Um, I'm sure you can also all imagine that it's sadly not often that we're now talking about one horse these days. The numbers just seem to go up and up. I mean, probably 10 years ago, a big horse case was about 10 or 20 horses. Uh, but now, unfortunately, it's not uncommon for it to be 40 upwards. In 2008, the Jamie Gray case at Amersham Farm saw 147 horses removed, 33 of which were dead. And this was considered to be the largest equine case this country had ever seen. Um, but unfortunately, we have gone on to since have multiple cases of similar size. And it's now not uncommon to have 100 plus, plus horses to be removed. Um, in addition to the assistance on the day, World Horse Welfare will also regularly assist with the boarding of the horses. Um, we've got four farms across the country with stocking, stocking capacities of around about 100 equines per farm. The RSPCA have two equine specific farms also and a number of places around the around country in their multi-species animal homes. Um, but largely these are often at capacity, which means that they have to use and pay for private boarding. I think it's important to point out that the role of field officer is, is not specifically to gather evidence uh, in, a, in a court case, in a prosecution. Um, however, our very presence at the scene often means that we're likely to be able to provide useful evidence that will be used in court. And for that reason, we provide a detailed witness statement and often give live evidence in court under oath. I think sometimes the hardest part of our job is, is managing the expectations of the public. Um, it's often difficult for the public to understand and acknowledge and identify that there's a real difference between what is a lower standard of care and what is a welfare concern. Um, we're often expected uh, to remove horses on the first visit or give out information that a caller may demand, but we're unable to provide because of data protection legislation or even allow a caller to have the horse themselves. And I think the area of animal welfare is such an emotive one, particularly for horse people. And, you know, as good owners, as good horse owners, we all invest our time, our money, our physical and emotional efforts into the well-being of our horses. And so it becomes intolerable for us when many who see others on the face of it don't do the same or fall way short of even the basic standards of care. And so the frustration of the public, you know, that ring into our welfare organisations is really real. And, and we absolutely understand that as an organisation, we've got 90 years of understanding of frontline work. And we know from experience what is a successful way of operating. And like the RSPC, so work country um, and we are aware of other organisations that are, are not run perhaps with policies or procedures or those that don't follow a code of conduct or sometimes have a sound ethos um, even those who effectively steal equines when they feel that they are in danger which whilst for some that they may say that that is understandable for those organisations it's it's not going to give them longevity to be able to serve both the public demands and the needs of equines long term who may need that intervention and so we do strive to you know, follow the rules and stay within the law and, and have policies and procedures in place. I thought I'd finish off really with a bit of um, myth busting if you like. Um, so I've just included a few of the, the most common ones that I see here and Dawn touched upon this earlier. Welfare officers have powers of seizure. <clears throat> the only officers in England and Wales, <coughs> excuse me, who can legally seize a horse for removal is a police officer or an appointed inspector under the Animal Welfare Act. And I think it's important to just clarify that 
when the Animal Welfare Act was brought in, the idea was supposed to be that the local authorities would appoint an animal welfare inspector and they would be given the powers under the Act. However, probably not surprised to hear that a lack of funding has meant that many of the councils, not all of them, um, many of them have not appointed an inspector. Um, some of them have, but certainly not as many as was intended and hence the reliance on the RSPCA. Um, the Scottish SPCA officers are appointed under the Act and so they're in a different position to the RSPCA in England and Wales. Um, it's worth mentioning that because field officers and RSPCA inspectors have no powers, if they are asked to leave a property, they, they must leave. The exception to this being unless a police warrant has been obtained, which in itself is, is complex and not something issued unless it's backed up by fact and, and evidence. Uh, horses that are fly grazed don't get removed by welfare organisations. Um, if there are significant health issues with a fly grazed horse, then welfare organisations can and do deal with these equines. Um, and we're often called upon to make those assessments for, for a landowner who may be non-horsey. If, however, the horse is free from welfare issues, then responsibility for removing that horse lies with the landowner. And the Control of Horses Act 2006 enables that landowner to be able to deal with and remove the horse effectively within four days if the procedure is followed and if no owner comes forward. It's therefore crucial that landowners protect their land and their property and take all the steps possible to ensure they are secure before an incident occurs and not after. Um, an abandoned horse is, is really different to that of a fly grazed horse. It's actually really, um, you know, it's not common that we actually come across a truly abandoned horse. But when we do, we have abandonment procedures that must be followed, which usually means that the animals are cared for in situ for a period of time until we can show that all attempts to contact an owner have been, well, futile. And again, a veterinary surgeon still needs to sign that certificate. Um, the period of time that the equine will be left in situ whilst being cared for, again, can vary greatly and it depends on its health and its environment um, and also actually on the number of horses. So that will factor into it also. Um, welfare officers don't go on to traveller sites. I think this is a myth which I just wish I knew the origin of. My colleagues and I do work with the traveller community really effectively. Um, traveller start site or five star event yard, if a concern is reported, it doesn't matter who you are, everybody is, is treated the same. It's no different to working with any other person from any other walk of life. In my experience, whether you're a traveller, a singular horse owner or a professional equestrian, honesty and a non-judgmental approach works best. And it's why really we work together to build those relationships relationships so we have a better chance of success. And uh, welfare cases are caused by cruelty and again Dawn touched on this earlier, I guess it depends on what you personally translate cruelty to be. For me cruelty is a deliberate act and so much of what we see is not deliberately, is not deliberate. Um, thankfully those acts are really rare. I think the visits that we carry out, again Dawn touched on them, you know can fall into so many different categories. Um, lack of knowledge, ignorance, um, being overwhelmed. I think mental health issues, probably as for the same as police, is a category that's risen dramatically over the years. Um, the ageing population of the country, a lack of finances, ultimately those living beyond their means. Um, hoarding has also risen dramatically. Um, tradition is another one. Um, and probably the most recent category which is, is, is the saddest one really, is the overwhelmed rescuer. Um, sadly, this is something that we're just seeing more and more of. Um, so to finish off tonight, I'd really just like to appeal to you as the public to continue to be interested in equine welfare, um, to continue to be observant and report your concerns. Um, and we are here to help. Thank you. Penny, thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I certainly learned a couple of things. Um, apologies, I had a couple of messages at the beginning from people to say that one of the slides got stuck, so I'm very sorry about that. Okay, Penny, hopefully that is working. 
That's great. Can you hear me okay, Hannah? Yep. Super. Yep. Uh, good evening, everybody. And I just wanted to say a thank you to the BHS for inviting me to speak this evening. And thank you all for joining us. Welfare is something that I'm, is not just a career for me. I'm incredibly passionate about it. And I strongly believe that the more that we can spread the word that horse welfare affects every single one of us, then the more chance we have of improving the welfare in this country and indeed further afield as well. The UK has some of the world's best animal welfare legislation, and yet we are still in the midst of an ongoing equine crisis. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about the details of my role in welfare, being a frontline officer for World Horse Welfare, and in particular, what's involved in a standard welfare visit right through to equine removals and seizures on investigation cases. Next slide, please, Hannah. I think it's probably appropriate just to show you what my career path looks like um, and how I ended up where I am today. And the area to highlight about my background is that in 2005, I joined the RSPCA as uh, an inspector. And I served for 12 years in that role. And for a good portion of that time, I also held a specialism role of equine officer. And this role was really created to respond to the needs of equines in the UK, but also to respond to the demands from the public for having equine knowledgeable officers. And the national team of equine officers, in addition to their normal role of inspector, would, for example, attend horse fairs such as Appleby, um, Stowe, Wickham. And they'd also promote rehoming events such as Your Horse Live and um, Equifest uh, in Peterborough as well as being part of, of teams that they specialise in rounding up large groups of feral horses or unhandled horses. In 2017, I joined World Horse Welfare to branch into that specialism role on a full-time basis. Uh, next slide, please, Hannah. I can't actually see the slide, Hannah, has it changed? Yeah. Um, the skills that are required for both the roles that I did are, are really quite similar. But as the equine crisis deepens at World Horse Welfare, we have developed new skills to help us achieve the improvements for equine welfare. And so my main task as a, a field officer is to respond to the calls of concern from, from members of the public. And during these visits, we aim to listen to our horse owners and, you know, echoing what Dawn said, we, we aim to educate, but also influence, uh, challenge and assist to improve the welfare of the animals that we visit. And with the help of the owners, achieve higher welfare results, crucially on a, a, what is hopefully a long term basis. I think it's important to recognise that um, our ethos is to work with horse owners to identify um, and correct welfare issues. However, we also know that science-based evidence tells us that, for example, for people who smoke, um, wagging a finger at that person and telling that person to quit smoking simply doesn't work. Um, it's what they've always done and it's a habit and it's become a way of life for them. So helping an owner identify something that needs changing in their horse's welfare is similar in its makeup. Um, and this human behaviour tool that started using is, is called motivational interviewing. And there's plenty online on the internet available if, if, those, if people are interested in knowing more about it. But um, this method of change has been around for quite a long time and it's really initially been used in the therapy and health industries. Um, but its use was identified as being so potentially successful that it's a transferable skill in so many other situations. And it's really a listening and engagement tool that has provided some really astonishing results for us at World Horse Welfare. And we really anticipate that human behaviour change is key to seeing more improved long term results in our current equine welfare crisis that we find ourselves in. However, there are, you know, we also recognise that motivational interviewing is not a miracle cure. And there are inevitably some people in life that 
be open to this method of communication or indeed there are situations that we visit which on that first occasion are so dire that immediate action is needed. At this point, I'll just touch upon again, like similar to how Dawn did um, in relation to the Welfare Act, because it is a key part of, of the work that we do. Um, and it's really important that we recognise the two main parts of the Animal Welfare Act that we work with. So section nine is what the Animal Welfare Act says an animal is likely to suffer if the circumstances do not change. It also encompasses the five freedoms that Dawn uh, talked about. And so when we make our visit, we will dynamically measure issues that we see um, against those five freedoms and against the codes of practice that are issued by the government. And every horse owner is actually duty bound to be aware of what the codes say. I think in reality, many horse owners, good horse owners alike, you know, even are not aware of their existence, but the codes are there and they set out what are recognised as good standards of practice um, that we should all be working at in the UK. As a field officer, I spend time with an owner putting into place an improvement plan, which naturally this will be over a period of time and that amount of time can vary considerably depending on what the issue is. But if, if an owner cannot show or prove that steps have been taken um, and that you know, the time has passed, then it's likely um, I, I would escalate the matter again, depending on the severity of the issue, that time frame you know, can be varied. And I'd stress at this point that generally our team are really successful in achieving the improvements that they seek. And it is ultimately far more preferable to achieve these goals with an owner rather than taking matters into uh, out of an owner's hands. So the next step then is to cover the other part of the Animal Welfare Act, which is known as Section 4. And this is when an animal is actually being caused to suffer. So um, whereas in Section 9 we talked about an animal which is likely to suffer, Section 4 is actual suffering that's been caused to the animal. So this suffering, as Dawn mentioned, um, can only be certified by a veterinary surgeon. Once the certification is established, either um, an equine is willingly signed over, so that would be an, uh, an owner relinquishing their ownership, or the equine must then be a police officer and only then can the equine be removed. And there's really no exception to that rule. I think with, you know, Dawn will, I'm sure, agree with me that with years of experience, you gain a good insight into what a vet is like to class as suffering. And so if I make a visit where those initial suspicions that the equine is already actually suffering, then the escalation is straight to the RSPCA. There may be some slight exceptions to that rule. However, um, and this is really where public understanding is perhaps sometimes lacking, this is not a vet saying that an animal is suffering because it's got slightly long or cracked feet or, or that it's a little bit underweight or it should have really been seen by a vet. This is a vet actually putting their professional opinion on the line, willing to stand up in a court of law at a trial and say that the equine has suffered because, for example, if it had a body score of 0.5 out of 5 or its feet had curled up and were off the floor, and curled right back over again, or if the horse had collapsed and it'd been down for days. From experience, I can tell you that what a normal member of public will feel is suffering is not, is not what a vet will deem is suffering. Um, it's true also that vets' opinions on suffering can vary greatly because after all, it, it is an opinion. The supporting vet will be required to explain and effectively prove or convince a court of the details of that suffering and they must be confident in their own opinion that they are right and also remember once you're in court there are two sides there is a prosecution side and there is a defense if the prosecution side have a vet or an expert witness or sometimes both so too will the defense so the prosecution vet will be responsible for explaining why the equine has suffered and also importantly the mechanics of the suffering but the defence vet will be responsible for explaining why it didn't suffer and why they disagree. Police and trading standards or the animal health sector are actually the prosecuting agencies in England and Wales. However, largely over a lack of resources, 
and because of a, a lack of expertise in animal welfare, prosecutions are routinely undertaken on a private basis, as Dawn said, by the RSPCA. There are some circumstances where the police and trading standards uh, will take on welfare court cases, but it's, it's normally for very, very specific reasons. And therefore, our working relationship with the RSPCA and their offices is absolutely key, as it is with all the other organisations too. Um, we both have mutually beneficial tools that we can utilise for assistance on both sides. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more of those shortly. I thought we'd take a look at a case study now to explain to you um, everything that we've basically just covered. So I'm going to introduce you to a horse called Monty. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please, Hannah. Very overgrown feet. Um, in this scenario, I tried very hard to work with the owner and was given a reasonable amount of time to instruct a farrier and to actually have them attend. Um, sadly, he failed to take that action over the two week period. Um, during that period, I was returning regularly to make, you know, make checks on the horse. Um, but it reached a point where I could now escalate the matter when no action had been taken. So after requesting the attendance from the RSPCA um, and with the attending vet and inspector present, I was able to show what efforts had been made to engage with the owner. Um, the vet agreed that the horse had, was now suffering and hence the removal of him was possible. Monty was successfully removed and treated and his owner was prosecuted. Um, for this offence, he was found guilty of a Section 4 suffering in relation to the horse's feet, as well as guilty of a Section 9 failing to meet the needs in relation to tethering. The court found that the DEFRA codes of practice had been breached, and they, as they stated that the tethering should only be used as a short-term measure, and while this was used as a long-term practice for this stallion, and hence the breach. If we go to the next slide, please, Hannah. And this is our friend Monty now. Um, you can see the picture on the left of the feet is a um, huge amount of heel in the before picture. And then the picture on the left is after he's had his trim. Um, actually, we took an awful lot of x-rays for this horse to make sure um, that the internal damage was rectifiable. And that is Monty on the right um, and now available for rehoming. So, Happy ending for him. So what is my role when we work with the RSPCA and we find ourselves in a situation where the equines will need to be seized and removed? And so for the most part, again, with some exceptions, the process of equine removal is not something which is pre-planned um, and hence it can happen at any time, although it does seem to have a habit, habit of happening on a, a, a Friday. But it can be any time of the day or night and with little or no notice. And this means that we need to have facilities and resources at our availability. Often our field officer's experience is vital to assisting the RSPCA. So I might be involved with catching or handling, maybe with the vet work or loading or rounding the horses up. Um, I'll often work with the vet while he or she is doing the examination. Um, and it's always the case, there's always a, a fair amount of paperwork that needs to be filled out too. I think the fact that we're able to concentrate on the equines is so helpful to the RSPCA because it means that the inspector is freed up to deal with an owner or maybe to gather other evidence, um, photographic or video, for example. And having been in that role myself, there is nothing harder than being stuck on that job by yourself, trying to handle a horse, deal with the vet, keep an owner calm, maybe log all the evidence, as well as arranging the transport. And so if we're not already involved with the job, it's quite common practice that the inspector will ring us direct and then we'll, we'll drop everything and we'll get there as quickly as we possibly can. can. Um, I'm sure you can also all imagine that it's sadly not often that we're now talking about one horse these days. The numbers just seem to go up and up. I mean, probably 10 years ago, a big horse case was about 10 or 20 horses. Uh, but now, unfortunately, it's not uncommon for it to be 40 upwards. In 
2008, the Jamie Gray case at Amersham Farm saw 147 horses removed, 33 of which were dead. And this was considered to be the largest equine case this country had ever seen. Um, but unfortunately, we have gone on to since have multiple cases of similar size. And it's now not uncommon to have 100 plus, plus horses to be removed. Um, in addition to the assistance on the day, World Horse Welfare will also regularly assist with the boarding of the horses. Um, we've got four farms across the country with stocking, stocking capacities of around about 100 equines per farm. The RSPCA have two equine specific farms also and a number of places around their around the country in their multi-species animal homes. Um, but largely these are often at capacity, which means that they have to use and pay for private boarding. I think it's important to point out that the role of field officer is, is not specifically to gather evidence uh, in, a, in a court case, in a prosecution. Um, however, our very presence at the scene often means that we're likely to be able to provide useful evidence that will be used in court. And for that reason, we provide a detailed witness statement and often give live evidence in court under oath. I think sometimes the hardest part of our job is, is managing the expectations of the public. Um, it's often difficult for the public to understand and acknowledge and identify that there's a real difference between what is a lower standard of care and what is a welfare concern. Um, we're often expected uh, to remove horses on the first visit or give out information that a caller may demand but we're unable to provide because of data protection legislation or even allow a caller to have the horse themselves. And I think the area of animal welfare is such an emotive one, particularly for horse people. Um, you know, as good owners, as good horse owners, we all invest our time, our money, our physical and emotional efforts into the well-being of our horses. And so it becomes intolerable for us when many who see others on the face of it don't do the same or fall way short of even the basic standards of care. And so the frustration of the public, you know, that ring into our welfare organisations is really real. And, and we absolutely understand that as an organisation, we've got 90 years of understanding of frontline work. And we know from experience what is a successful way of operating. And like the RSPC, so work country um, and we are aware of other organisations that are, are not run perhaps with policies or procedures or those that don't follow a code of conduct or sometimes have a sound ethos um, even those who effectively steal equines when they feel that they are in danger which whilst for some that they may say that that is understandable for those organisations it's it's not going to give them longevity to be able to serve both the public demands and the needs of equines long term who may need that intervention and so we do strive to you know, follow the rules and stay within the law and, and have policies and procedures in place. I thought I'd finish off really with a bit of um, myth busting if you like. Um, so I've just included a few of the, the most common ones that I seem to hear and Dawn touched upon this earlier Welfare officers have powers of seizure. <clears throat> the only officers in England and Wales, <coughs> excuse me, who can legally seize a horse for removal is a police officer or an appointed inspector under the Animal Welfare Act. And I think it's important to just clarify that when the Animal Welfare Act was brought in, the idea was supposed to be that the local authorities would appoint an animal welfare inspector and they would be given the powers under the Act. However, probably not surprised to hear that a lack of funding has meant that many of the councils, not all of them, um, many of them have not appointed an inspector. Um, some of them have, but certainly not as many as was intended and hence the reliance on the RSPCA. Um, the Scottish SPCA officers are appointed under the Act and so they're in a different position to the RSPCA in England and Wales. Um, it's worth mentioning that because field officers and RSPCA inspectors have no powers, if they are asked to leave a property, they, they must leave. The exception to this being unless a police warrant has been obtained, which in itself is, is complex and not something issued unless it's backed up by fact and, and evidence. Uh, horses that are fly grazed don't get removed by welfare organisations. Um, 
If there are significant health issues with a fly grazed horse, then welfare organisations can and do deal with these equines. Um, and we're often called upon to make those assessments for, for a landowner who may be non-horsey. If, however, the horse is free from welfare issues, then responsibility for removing that horse lies with the landowner. And the Control of Horses Act 2006 enables that landowner to be able to deal with and remove the horse effectively within four days if the procedure is followed and if no owner comes forward. It's therefore crucial that landowners protect their land and their property and take all the steps possible to ensure they are secure before an incident occurs and not after. Um, an abandoned horse is, is really different to that of a fly grazed horse. It's actually really, um, you know, it's not common that we actually come across a truly abandoned horse. But when we do, we have abandonment procedures that must be followed which usually means that the animals are cared for in situ for a period of time until we can show that all attempts to contact an owner have been, well, futile. And again, a veterinary surgeon still needs to sign that certificate. Um, the period of time that the equine will be left in situ whilst being cared for, again, can vary greatly. And it depends on its health and its environment um, and also actually on the number of horses. So that will factor into it also. Um, Welfare officers don't go on to traveller sites. I think this is a myth which I just wish I knew the origin of. My colleagues and I do work with the traveller community really effectively. Um, traveller start site or five star event yard, if a concern is reported, it doesn't matter who you are, everybody is, is treated the same. It's no different to working with any other person from any other walk of life. In my experience, whether you're a traveller, a singular horse owner or a professional equestrian, honesty and a non-judgmental approach works best. And it's why really we work together to build those relationships so we have a better chance of success. And uh, welfare cases are caused by cruelty. And again, Dawn touched on this earlier. I guess it depends on what you personally translate cruelty to be. For me, cruelty is a deliberate act. And so much of what we see is not deliberately, is not deliberate. Um, thankfully, those acts are really rare. I think the visits that we carry out, again, Dawn touched on them, you know, can fall into so many different categories. Um, lack of knowledge, ignorance, um, being overwhelmed. I think mental health issues, probably as for the same as police, is a category that's risen dramatically over the years. Um, the ageing population of the country, a lack of finances, ultimately those living beyond their means. Um, hoarding has also risen dramatically. Um, tradition is another one. Um, and probably the most recent category, which is, is, is the saddest one really, is the overwhelmed rescuer. Um, sadly, this is something that we're just seeing more and more of. Um, so to finish off tonight, I'd really just like to appeal to you as the public to continue to be interested in equine welfare, um, to continue to be observant and report your concerns. Um, and we are here to help. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much um, for having us this evening. Um, myself and Lauren um, are really pleased to be able to come and share some of the work that we do for Blue Cross. Um, so slightly different, moving on from World Horse Welfare and BHS, we're gonna be focusing on the rehoming of horses. Um, so just to start um, a little bit about Blue Cross, um, for those of you that don't know, the charity was founded in 1897. So originally helping animals of war and over the years has developed into the charity um, that we know and love today. Um, so the aim is that every pet, pet enjoys a healthy life in a happy home. So five main sectors of Blue Cross, um, one of which sort of Dawn um, touched on, which is really um, important, is the education. So Blue Cross offer free education from, um, you know, young groups such as sort of rainbows, scouts, guides up through colleges, schools, um, a free talk on pet care. Um, 
which is fantastic as well, um, along with us doing sort of talks like this um, for the equine sector working under the umbrella of the National Equine Welfare Council um, to do as much education as we can to sort of limit um, welfare cases or horses having to come into charities and take up um, you know take valuable spaces. Um, we have a behaviour department um, at Blue Cross again dedicated to keep animals um, in homes uh, we have a pet bereavement support service, so we recognise how important um, animals are to individuals um, and the service has been extremely popular in supporting those in difficult times of losing their pets. Um, we offer veterinary care to small animals, so that's dogs um, and smaller animals with our four uh, animal hospitals. And then rehoming, so Blue Cross rehomes small animals um, from sort of hamsters right up to horses, which is where Lauren and I come in, being rehoming coordinators. So between us, we've got 10 years of service um, at Blue Cross um, and we work at the Burford Centre in Oxfordshire, but we also have a horse unit up in Rolston upon Dove, um, which is in Derbyshire. Um, so if I could have the first slide, please. So um, admissions. So we take on average 10 to 15 horses every month into Blue Cross. Um, so this is reflective of how many horses we've rehomed. So um, on average, um, we are rehoming up to sort of 15 horses a month. Sometimes it's more. Um, the horses that we get in, so they're sometimes uh, from private homes, um, depending um, on the individual situation and what help they require. And then we're working collaboratively with other charities, uh, predominantly RSPCA and DSPCA. Um, so after horses have been taken in from extreme welfare cases and they've had that first bit of intervention of handling veterinary care, they're then, we're then taking horses from those um, charities after they've had that to us with a view that we will be rehoming them. So just to clarify that, yeah, we're not a sanctuary and that all horses come with us with a view to be rehomed. Other horses that may come in each month are Blue Cross horses returning off loan. So all of our horses um, initially go out on a loan basis, so they're not transferred. So this gives um, a bit of safety net for us, um, making sure we have uh, made the right decision to rehome to individuals and as well for those people that take on horses from us, um, that we will always take a Blue Cross horse back. So part of the admissions process at Blue Cross is that all horses have strangles testing. They have two week um, initial assessments, so we have um, a farrier um, and veterinary check. So every horse has a um, sees the vet within the first four days of arriving, um, covering a health check, which includes all your sort of standard heart, eyes, lungs, trot up. So again, although they may have had previous intervention, again, this is just picking up anything we possibly can um, to give us a full picture for rehoming. They stay for a period of four weeks in our admissions. So we're lucky enough that we have a separate um, barn, grazing and stables area than our main site. So this is for biosecurity reasons. Um, so things like we're gonna be looking for lice, mites, worms. Um, like I said, we'll be doing our strangles testing. And again, that four weeks gives us that, you know, um, to make sure we're not putting anything into our main herds. Um, so we're lucky that we are geared up for that. Um, and then in this time as well, we're going to be doing our initial handling uh, photos, videos in preparation for rehoming. So if I could have the next slide, please, Hannah. So, um, as I said, as well as our uh, vet within the first week of arrival, we'll be doing our own um, initial health checks. And all of this, um, as well as sort of behaviour assessment. So we're going to be making decisions on whether these horses that come into us um, will be sort of a youngster project, i.e. being rehomed with a view to be backed within the home environment. Um, if it already has ridden potential, so we could, if it was old enough that we can work on it and site, or as a non-ridden companion. So non-ridden companions are, um, the, the, the type that we predominantly deal with and we successfully rehome a lot of. 
Um, so all of our training sessions are recorded, so we get to build up a really sort of clear picture about the horses um, and ponies that we're dealing with um, and to be able to correctly match them to homes. After the four weeks is completed in admissions, they're handed over. So we've got separate staff working in our admissions, handed over to our main um, herd star, um, <laughs> main yard staff. So they go into our main herds. Um, and the work continues and we're very, you know, obviously pass over all of the information to the other team. And yeah, I'd just like to say we do continue handling our non-ridden companions. They get just as much as attention as um, a horse that was being backed um, or looking to be backed in the future. Okay, we have the next slide, which are over to Lauren. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Um, so we um, obviously delve then into the training and the advertising aspect of Blue Cross. Um, we have regular meetings to discuss the rehomeability and training needs of each and individual horse, along with any veterinary attention that might be required um, long term. Um, so we have these as a team and on a one to one basis where necessary. Um, our training supervisor tailors plans to further the horse's education whilst at the centre, focusing on improvement and key factors to get them rehomed as quickly, but as effectively, obviously, as we can. Our veterinary and yard supervisor also ensures that we as rehomers are up to date with anything about veterinary that may be preventing them to be advertised so soon. We like to obviously maximise our rehoming opportunities by getting handling videos and photos of the ponies as soon as we can. So for this, we use sort of headshots for the up and coming on the website and furthermore to this, more professional photos for their rehoming profiles and case studies once they get more settled. We put our horses on the website as up and coming. This gains a lot of early interest in them. We can do this as early as a few weeks following the initial assessments that Abby just took you through. And then we can plan for appointments at a later date. We rehome at any point as well, should the right home become available. So for an example, a project of two, three years of age who we cannot back at the centre, um, we would advertise them looking for an experienced home to bring them on as a backing horse. And companions, obviously, we have a few with specific requirements, such as ongoing weight loss that could be carried out in a home rather than taking up valuable space at the centre for another horse in need. We obviously make very conscious decisions when it comes to these homes. The length of stay can vary on each individual horse, but as I touched on previously, we do rehome at any point. And on average, a horse can be with us from three to six months and occasionally longer. For example, we do get mares in foals that come to the centre or those with higher training needs, so they would be with us for a longer period. They're obviously carefully managed and we are very good at knowing when to place them in our foster and support yards or on a short-term loan basis situation to benefit the horse and free up space again at the centre. We do a lot of promotion via our website, on our Facebook pages, and we ensure their profiles are always up to date. And we also work closely with other organisations to promote our horses up for rehoming. Both centres do have a variety of support yards set up and they're used to free up space at the centre and also the horses get an opportunity then to settle in different environments and have different sort of varied handling. Our fosterers are all trained to a similar standard to our on-site team and they also receive ongoing checks and training whilst they have horses in our care and they can also carry out appointments with us which is very valuable to our staff. Next slide please. So leading on to the ultimate goal <laughs> which is rehoming, um, we do obviously rehome on a long-term basis as standard and we do allow some horses to be placed in homes for a shorter period on a case-by-case -case basis. We do now also offer transfer of ownership of the majority of our horses and we have done for a number of years and been very successful in doing this. A horse has to be placed in a home and have regular home visits successfully before ownership can be offered. For example, the weight needs to be of healthy level and their vaccinations, dental and farrier needs to be all up to date, along with any specific handling and training the horse needs to be going well advertised on a very variety of platforms so again they're advertised on the facebook website and other social pages as we've already touched on i'll just run through our application process um, so if you were to apply for one of our horses you can apply for a specific horse on our website or there is a generic rehoming form 
And if you don't see anything you like in particular that think you think that would suit, please do fill in a form and obviously our rehomers will match you to anything that we might have on the website or up and coming in the future. This comes through to our rehoming inbox and all the rehomers deal with these on an individual basis and respond accordingly to you. If, you're a, if you are a successful match, then you will hear from a rehomer personally, and we will ask for photos of your facilities and potentially videos of your handling and riding if you're applying for a ridden horse. And we will all then we will then explain about our rehoming process and invite you for an appointment. This would be a handling appointment for a companion or a riding assessment for a ridden horse or project, and we would use our schoolmaster to assess your ridden ability. During this time, we are currently completing everything virtually, so it's a little bit different, but still very successful currently. You'll then receive a home visit, visit from the allocated welfare coordinator. They will then discuss long term plans with you, check your facilities in person or via a video, video call and then when they will be coming to visit in the future. Passing this, a leaving health check for the horse is agreed and collection is then arranged. We currently advise the use of transporters during the current climate, but we also can deliver horses should they require our personal care and expertise for travelling. Once the horse is in a home, we'll then always ensure the horse is settled after a few weeks and hand you over to the care of our welfare team. Now I can hand over to Abby to speak a little bit more about our home direct and home to home schemes. Thank you. So um, our home to home scheme um, is set up to um, minimise the movement of Blue Cross ponies. So should um, for any reason someone give um, notice of return of a Blue Cross horse or pony, we will put them on the home to home scheme. So we will look to try and rehome that pony or horse directly from the current home it's in to another Blue Cross borrower. So that's what we call our loan homes, they're Blue Cross borrowers. Um, so this again um, tries to minimise the amount of horses having to return to the centre and as well the disruption of moving the horse too many times. Now we have a, a fantastic scheme called Home Direct, um, which started with horses back in 2015. Um, so this is a, a, a scheme that we set up to help um, individuals such as yourselves, should you be um, in the position that you need to rehome your horse and are looking to do so responsibly. This might be because you can't sell your horse, um, so it may um, you know, it may be a ridden that's now been retired due to injury age. Um, and again, you're worried about where the horse might end up or it being passed around. So the scheme um, works in the way that you apply through us, and I will have the details um, in a later slide, um, where we would ask you to fill out all information um, about your horse on an application. Um, and then you will be contacted by a Blue Cross representative who will talk you through the scheme and the suitability of your horse to the scheme. And along with an assessment by a Blue Cross representative, you will have a veterinary health check done and hopefully they'll be suitable for the scheme and could be advertised on the website as any other Blue Cross horse. And then the matching process is exactly the same as Lauren um, explained for a centre horse. However, the horse will stay in the care and the ownership of the owner until the such a point where we rehome and that's when it's transferred into ownership of the Blue Cross. So um, we would do, facilitate appointments um, at its current home. So it's been a really successful scheme. Um, we've had amazing feedback um, and uh, definitely something we'd, um, we're looking to promote um, over the coming um, months. Thank you, Hannah, if you could. Uh, so we have a couple of just little stories of horses that have um, come to us. So Lauren's going to speak to you about Denny. So Denny was found fly grazing um, before he was admitted into Blue Cross care. Um, he arrived in such poor condition. He was covered in lice, mud fever, had a high worm burden, had a nasty wound on his face, um, which was later discovered to be an abnormal and rotten teeth, um, probably because he'd never seen the dentist um, in his previous um, home. Um, so Denny needed a huge amount of dentistry work to correct his teeth. Um, we raised, uh, we did, we did a sort of give penny um, fundraising page, um, and we had to raise sort of three hundred, three thousand six hundred pounds for Denny um, to be able to get a specialist dentist to come and um, do some corrective surgery on him. Um, this was ongoing for months and months, um, from having sort of normal dentistry done um, to further investigations. 
his rehabilitation was very long um, and we all always had to ensure that sort of the whole way along all of his basic health needs were met um, but also his ongoing teeth problems and the impact this would have on his rehabilitation. Um, luckily for Denny um, we saw the potential in him as a future riding horse as he was only young um, so once he was um, back up to full health um, we were able to back him at the centre which was lovely to sort of see him progressing um, you know from sort of welfare case right through to to the rehoming and re-riding sort of process. Um, so all in all Danny was with us 14 months from admitting him to rehoming him um, so he he was one of our sort of longest stayers that we've sort of n had known sort of over the past sort of few years um, but he is now successfully transferred in his loan home that he's been in for a couple of years now. Thank you. Okay. Next slide please Hannah. Um, and this is um, Piglet's story. Um, so um, Piggy came in in uh, November 18. Um, so yeah, slightly different story. So she was overweight um, and suffering from laminitis. So again, I think um, probably um, having spoken to sort of other charities, this um, the overweight uh, horses are becoming a lot more prevalent these days. Um, so yeah, so she had a period of four months box rest, so quite an extended time, a lot of specific management. Um, and again, this sort of following through to rehoming is why our processes, um, you know, are, are so specific and, and the way we work is because there are ponies like Piglet, where we're looking for a home that can provide the management. We're lucky that we're purpose built at Burford. Um, so, um, you know, it's that education and teaching people and using our appointment process to be able to explain um, in detail the management um, that these ponies need to go on um, and be successful in a home. So pleased to say that um, she was rehomed in June uh, 2019. Um, so seven months with us and she um, is a lovely little riding pony um, so she's got a sort of fantastic um, home and they're very much enjoying her um, so another success story um, but again um, yeah it's just this um, goes back to sort of this education and teaching people um, of you know how to care for horses again because she was a typical case of, of being allowed to sort of eat and, and graze incorrectly but another su success so um, if I could have the next slide, please, Hannah. I think that's our contact details. So um, if you'd like to find out anything um, or any more detail on Blue Cross, that's our website address. If you're interested in rehoming, all our horses available are advertised on the website. Um, but for any equine um, in, uh, rehoming inquiries, we've got the um, email address there. If you are looking for help to rehome your own horse on the Home Direct scheme that I explained, the Help My Horse address is there. Again, there are details of that on the website. And myself and Lauren's personal um, work email addresses are there should you have any direct questions for us. But thank you very much um, for giving us the time this evening.